Hello and welcome to Conversations with Mother Earth, brought to you by Grounded Press. My name is Dana Petrovic, and each week my guests and I shed light on one aspect of Mother Earth and the gifts that she gives us. We also discuss why these gifts are so precious and why we should value them. You got you curious? Good. We love curiosity. Let's start. Today's topic, dear listeners, is diversity. And it's a dominant topic at the moment, but in a negative sense, because far too frequently we learn of negative news about yet another irreparable loss of our biodiversity. Less obvious and reported, we became aware of losing more and more regional languages leaving our dominant language to shape reality. And there's a positive side too. Every day we learn of yet another company that publicly declares its commitment to diversity. This podcast is called Conversations with Mother Earth. Dear listeners, you might rightfully ask, what does nature really have to do with our business reality? The answer is everything. We are nature. And thus in past episodes, we covered the topics like healthy soil, water, and organic food. Even our appliances and tools all come from nature. They all have to be dig up from soil, deep, deep, deep in earth in order for us to have them. So we are nature in every sense of the world. If we can learn one thing from nature, it is that diversity makes our world more bountiful and more beautiful. Despite all good efforts, our business world is still quite homogeneous, with men still leading the vast majority of companies, despite more than 50% of business graduates in the leading economies being female. The issue of inequality with gender looks even bleaker when we consider entrepreneurs seeking funding, with women receiving only a shocking 3% of global venture capital. As you will learn in this episode, these inequities stem from both deliberate and conscious, as well as unconscious biases towards women. It is because of this issue that I welcome today's guest, Anna Rolf, who is a non-expert in this field. She had, has had a 15-year legal career, as well as working with female founders and investors through the Ladies Investment Club and her capital. She's a co-founder of SOFIA, that provides capital and education to women to assist them to achieve their financial goals. Tanya is from the UK and is currently based in Singapore. Tanya, a very warm welcome to Conversations with Mother Earth. Thank you very much for having me. Very happy to be here. Tanya, what motivated you as a lawyer to shift from from being a lawyer to shedding more light on the discriminatory issues of underfinanced female entrepreneurs? Very good question. Um, So I actually, the last um, 10 years or so that I was working in law firms, I was actually working as um, uh, in a business manager type role. And um, one of the one of the tasks that I was in charge of many years ago was a gender equality um, project, which was to work out where all the women lawyers were going, why why we were losing them along their way at some point during their career. We were hiring um, more than 50% of trainee lawyers as as females and 50% were were men. Uh, But when you looked at the senior leadership, we were, you know, somewhere in the high 90s um, percent of, of men, male partners versus female partners. So something was happening during their 
career as lawyers in big international law firms and what what was happening. And so I ran this project to to discover that and uh, that my findings really unsettled me. And I realized that it wasn't the problem wasn't with the women per se. Uh, It wasn't that they just said, oh, I've had enough of this. It was that the 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 framework of working in a in a law firm or in any type of corporate coupled with um you know parenting responsibilities and also just wanting a bit of a work life balance just there was indiscrepancies there and it was um you that p- women were not able to um uh, reconcile um not seeing their children for their work etc and were forced to make a choice and so i came away from working in law moved to singapore and had that fire in my belly for all of the issues that i saw and that's when i sort of started out on my focus of of working with um females yeah yeah that's it's a great work i've been following your work for uh quite some time now and that's one of the reasons uh, why i reached out because these inequitable numbers are sobering there is no doubt no matter how we look at them we come to the same result to use the mother earth term uh what is the root of this problem um it's not just in lawyers i mean i see the same in a business mm. world it's you said children is one sorry to add this to to the topic children and family are one but what else is there so I mean, this is a very, very complex question. It's super um, difficult. And I don't think that there's any one or even two or three things in isolation that are the root of the problem. I think it is many, many things. And I can touch on some of the key issues that I see. I think that um, I think that we still have a largely male leadership from, um, you know, if, looking back in history, you know, relatively speaking, women are still um, quite new to the workforce. And so having more women in leadership roles takes time. Um, And I think that when you have uh, a lot of men in these roles, it's very hard to, um, to shift that and start just, you know, putting women into these roles. And if we do do that um, into senior roles, then, um, you know, that is controversial as too, because we're taking sort of affirmative action and just putting women into roles because we need women in roles, in senior roles. And I'm not sure that that's the right answer, but if we wait and let things happen organically, we're probably going to be waiting, you know, decades, if not centuries, um, for anything resembling um, gender parity. So it's a super, super challenging um, uh, answer. I think that a question, sorry, I think that we as women also, as I mentioned, you know, we have, ch- we, we often want to be there um, for our families. And often it still is the woman that takes the brunt of childcare responsibilities. So I think there's, as I said, you know, and if you're having all of these pressures at work to be present, to be, you know, online 24 seven, particularly during these COVID times where we're, you know, always accessible because we're always at home and we're working. Um, And I think that there's no on off switch and and you're being pulled. um, I can relate to that as a a mum of two children, Um, you know, more often than not people will choose their children um, if they're forced into a a decision. Um, So I think there's that. I think there's also, you know, we have to look at women ourselves as well. We're, you know, quite often opting out ourselves um, and because of situations, particularly in the finance sector, which is where I work largely, you know, that's mostly men in there. And I can understand why women do self, you know, opt out because if you graduate, I think you mentioned in your intro about um, more than 50% of business graduates are are women. Uh, If you draw that down into finance or economics, tech graduates, I mean, those numbers are getting smaller. And then when they've graduated, if they then look, you know, okay, I'm going to become an investment banker. Let me just go and have a look at all these investment banks. Oh, a whole sea of men in dark suits. And again, and again, and again, it isn't appealing. It just isn't. And, you know, I, I wouldn't want a job like that. Um, I would be thinking about, oh, how am I going to balance all of my other things? My life, I, I like a life as well, not just that I'm a mom, but I'm Tanya. Um, I want to have a social life. And, and how do we 
how do I balance all of the, those things? And I think that that's the root of the problem is that we're just, we just haven't evolved in how we're working and how we're thinking about work and specifically for women. Yeah, it's, it's also glorified. The men are glorified for working all these hours and mm. yet we see all the health issues and health problems and burnout um, among men and women equally because of that, uh, of, of the pressure and this uh, stigma of a successful man works so many hours. And of course we say, <laughs> well, that's not life. Um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But speaking about graduates, I just, uh, um, just came to my mind, actually in our current you know, re recent uh, international business program here at the university, we have over 50% of uh, females, start, females starting the economics, starting international mm -hmm. business program, bachelor program. So yeah, these numbers, these numbers are increasing. And the other thing that I read once, I remember that men are more prone to support women in their career if they have daughters. Hmm, interesting. Um, I guess my view on that is um, decent people are decent people, whether they they have daughters or not, because at the end of the day, all men have a mother. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of them have a sister. Exactly. I I think it's less to do. I mean, maybe having a daughter kind of gets you thinking and reignites some kind of or ignites I should say some kind of special interest maybe but I do tend to think that if you are genuinely concerned and, and want to do the right thing and see the benefits of this then you do that anyway and I think that they're just because I, I know plenty of men that have daughters that really don't give you know give a damn about about gender equality. So I, I think it's less to do with that and more to do with just being a decent human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there are also differences among cultures because we do leadership training in, in different culture, different countries and also how that is, what is considered, yeah. with, um, you know, who is subordinate to who and all that. Yes. Um, it's, it's an ego, it's also an ego issue, but that's a different story for itself and as a psychologist, which uh, well, none of us is. But tell us some of the female stories, because you have been working with female entrepreneurs for a few years now. Tell us about some of the stories that they shared, what they experienced when they, when they, when they looked for venture capital. So that's a great question. So you, are, I think you said in your intro around um, about women receiving 3% of venture capital funding. And that is um, actually on the optimistic side. Wow. I think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that we were, from memory, I think 2012, we were at 3%. So that's 10 years ago. And then roll the clock forward, I think it was nine years. So um, 2019, sorry, 2019, so seven years on. Um, we were still at 3%. So then the dial wasn't moving. Then COVID hit. And as we all know, women took more, you know, took the brunt of the, the job losses, um, took the brunt of the homeschooling, uh, you know, the, the compromises that had to be made within a family. And, and so that number went back to around 2.3% at um early on in during the covid pandemic now i think we've clawed a little bit back but we're talking a you know a 0.23% so we potentially are around 2.8% if we're feeling optimistic and it's a nice sunny friday day here in singapore so let's say it's 2.8% so that's the optimistic number um i don't think it sounds very good um that's a global number and i think that I think that there's a few reasons for this. I think um, there are institutional biases and institutional investors are flowing capital through to venture capitalists that they know and they've invested with before many, many times. And, and then those venture capitalists are investing that money into founders, the type, typical types of founders that they've always invested into. And I think that that's one reason why women receive such little funding. So gender biases, I would say, because they're all looking for a safe investment. 
So even though venture capital sounds like it's risky and everyone's throwing cash all over the place, actually, it's pretty risk averse. And they just want to, OK, well, we've done this similar deal like this before, so let's do it. So I think that um, the flow of capital goes from institutional investor to venture capitalist to founder who all look the same. That's one major problem. And irrespective of whether institution, financial institutions say that they are investing into more diverse founders and being, you know, hitting their, they, you know, it's great marketing for a lot of companies to get out there and say, oh, look at us, we're investing into women or diverse founders, or we're doing this program, blah, blah, blah. Um, it really actually trans, you know, transpires into anything material for women. So it often is just box checking and um, lip service. So the flow of capital is very biased. And I think then you've also got lack of deal flow. So if you're a VC, um, and I can think of three or four in Singapore, and you look at their portfolio of companies online, every single company is male-led. And when you look at their team, it's all men. So if I'm a female founder and I've just bought, built this amazing business for women, for menopause, am I really going to go knocking on that venture capitalist door and I know I'm going to be faced with a sea of men and I'm going to have to talk to them about menopause and menopausal symptoms, et cetera, that they're not going to understand. And I know that they invest in a certain type of founder and I can see that on their website, just not gonna happen. So I think there's deal access. So VCs are looking all in the same places. They're all chasing after the same deals. So I think there's a couple of reasons women are not you know, putting themselves out there into those funds, um, but, sure, but definitely the problem is not with the women or lack of women founders. There is not a lack of investable women founders, period. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And what are some of the questions that female entrepreneurs get when they do get into one of these rooms? Aha. Now, that is an amazing question because it has been proven that the questions do differ from men to women. And I think that this is wholly why we have to have diverse investment teams because what, conf you know, how VCs judge confidence is. Um, you know, if we're all men, we all think that confidence looks like X. But if we're men and women, and we all come from diverse backgrounds, confidence looks very different. Looks, it, 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 you know, and so we're judging founders in a different way. So it's been proven that men are asked questions around. Um, okay, great. You've you've just given us a pitch. This is amazing. Um, and once you've achieved all of these amazing things, you're out to achieve. What's next? What's the next big vision? Where do we go from here? How do we get bigger and grow and make more money? So, of course, the answer to that is, oh, well, we take on this and we do that. And I'm going to, you know, be, you know, the next Elon Musk within three minutes. And it's, it allows for, you know, talking a big game and very positive words and a, and a great story, which, of course, investors want to hear. If you're a woman, it's been proven that the questions you're asked are much more, um, oh, okay, so I see you've got your financial predictions here. And, and what happens if you don't achieve those? Yeah. Like what's, plan, what's plan B? Yeah. So, of course, the answer comes with, oh, well, well, when it all goes wrong, you know, this is what I might do or this is what I might do. That's a very different you know, story is a very different narrative to be sharing with many sort of negative words attached to it and, and negative connotations. I think that you come away from that meeting as an investor with just a very different experience. Yeah, definitely. That most definitely. That's a completely that steers the conversation in a completely different direction. That is so true. Um, let's look now. These are kind of outside. This is an outside framework that we have to change. And obviously, you have shown us clearly where the weaknesses are. But let's look also at us women. Yeah. Because it's not everything out there with men and, uh, and the system in which uh, we operate as business. Um, here we have, for example, one thing I observed, and I don't know if you, if you can confirm this with your work. But I felt that the females view their relationship with money differently than men. And some women might even consider money as dirty. 
Have you have you experienced? Have you encountered women um, that have that consider money, yeah, not good? Yeah, um, I don't know that I have experienced that like dirty or not good. I think that there's a um, there's probably a couple of things. I think our financial education in our schooling is is non-existent. I think for both men and for women. I think that often um, men move more into financial roles um, and women don't. And I think for the reasons that I talked about earlier, you know, if there's a lot of men in these roles, it's not appealing. And that in itself is a problem, How because how do we inject more women? So I think that if we don't... Um, if we haven't had the education, so, you know, men and women, boys and girls haven't had that education. We haven't learned about personal finances at school, which is a massive failing by governments all around the world. Um, we then leave school and it's like, well, off you go, guys. You need to just start managing your money and make some wealth and live happy, you know, happy lives, carefree from money worries. How, where do you start? And I think that men are actually exceptionally good at just getting out there and just doing it and and chit chatting about it amongst their friends and sharing you know ideas and potentially investment opportunities and oh I've got this founder I was playing golf with him on the weekend he wants some money for his business and then boy you know men start start that way and I think for women because we then large pools of women do not enter enter into those financial roles as I uh, talked about it it the gap just widens and widens and then and the financial world is full of jargon so I think there's an also a concern around you know asking the wrong questions potentially looking silly um how do we and and I think that that is probably why the last thick point I would make on this to this question is that the wealth management um, industry is largely run by men and it's largely providing products and services that are geared up with men in mind. So women are keeping more of their money in cash because not because they, they, um, they're uneducated. I mean, that, that's clearly a problem for, for both sexes, but I think it's because there's nothing out there that's resonating either. So, you know, it has been proven that women like to do good with their money. So it's not just how am I going to get the most amount of money back or who can I hand my money over to and then never think about it again. I want to know that this money is doing some good for our planet, for our future, and I'm getting returns as well. And if we think the wealth management system is run by men for men, then women have not been included in that um, in their thinking and their products. So there's very list, few places for them to go. So I think it, it's a multifaceted answer, but I think that they're probably the large li reasons why women shy away from these discussions and why Sophia is here. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Um, there's um, other, uh, of course, you mentioned the boys club, the golf club and all the other, all of that, uh, of course, has to change or, or uh, we have to balance that. But the other thing is, is it not true, Tanya, that uh, we women have also have to change our attitudes of how we value contributions of other women? Is it not true that, uh, our, that we sometimes discount another woman's potential? Yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Yes, I wrote something this morning and someone and, and I was asked a question uh, of what advice I could give to women in an interview, what advice I could give to women. Um, and I said, support other women. And I think that women supporting women is super powerful. Uh, like I said earlier, we're, we're the majority population, we're 51% of the population. So we don't have to be victims here. With a majority population, um, exactly. by the end of this year, holding ninety-three trillion dollars in wealth. So, let's mobilize that. Let's put our money where our mouth is. Let's support other women. Let's be champions for other women, and let's you know not cause more problems than we already have. So, and I think that that is 
powerful when you think about it that way. Because when I came out of working at the VC and I was super frustrated and ang- I was actually angry at the world, at this, this gender bias. And I could have just wallowed in that anger and frustration at the world. Or I could say, well, actually, out of chaos and something that's not right is huge potential and huge opportunity for us to do something. Exactly. And, and so I believe that that is women mobilizing themselves and their capital to support other women. And that's a very good idea. That's a very, very good idea. Yes, and it's a, it's a good chunk of money that women can do a lot of good stuff for, for themselves, for their families, for the planet. We have a, a classic win-win situation for everybody. Yeah. Um, another thing that I, uh, while I was preparing for this interview, made me think of my time in Germany. It has to do with the, this, this proportional representation of women in management. A back, few years back, Germany had a discussion about imposing um, quotas to get more women into the senior positions, into the, C's, into the board, mem- board uh, rooms of German companies and all that. And actually, some women were against these mandatory quotas because they felt like, as you said this few times, women choose to spend time with their families and they rightfully wanted to do that as well, which is fine. And Germans have a very good expression about this topic that says Leben und Leben lassen, which translates to live and let live. In other words, let other women decide what is best for them. What is your perspective on how we perceive freedom, especially freedom of other women? How much do we dictate actually? Oh yeah, I'm doing this and you should be doing that too. Um, so when it comes to quotas, I, I think that will always, that's controversial. And I think that it, it will all, always elicit controversial and outspoken views in both camps. I think I said it earlier that if we don't have quotas, if we don't take affirmative action, then we can expect decades and wait for for any real substantial material change. So it's not ideal. I don't think that it's best, you know, I don't think I'm a huge advocate for it, but I can understand the rationale behind it and I'm not against it for that reason. When it comes to living and living, I mean, we're all different, aren't we? And and I have, I, I work in Singapore, I have two small children and my choice is to work and I could very easily have spent the last seven years almost seven years um, since I've had children at home with the two of them and I made a decision to stop working in law at the time I had children and do something that allowed me more autonomy and so freedom over my own time I have friends that work 16 hours a day and have multiple children. And I have friends that don't work at all and are there 24 seven with their children. And I see, I can think of two people that fit those molds myself and I'm somewhere in the middle. So I see someone who's not working at all and two children like mine. And, you know, she's, she has a super tough time because parenting is really, really hard. And she's, yeah, and she's there for every every single thing those children do. She is there for them. And that's her choice. And I respect that. And I look at my other friend, 16 hours a day, feels guilty she doesn't see the kids, but this is her career and she's really passionate about it. Um, and her husband picks up the, you know, a, a lot of the slack. And I think that I see how challenging that is too. And I'm in the middle somewhere, I would I, I think. Um and every single one of those cases is absolutely fine. Let, live and let live, like you say. Um, I don't have an opinion. Is mm-hmm. I think that's the thing. Is I don't think we can we can have an opinion on what is right or what is wrong for exactly. other people. It's exactly. just what is right for you and your family. Exactly. That's exactly the point. Live and let live, and let other women decide for themselves. 
because as you said, parenting is a full-time job as is working in a career in a full-time job. And these are our choices and both deserve respect. Um, yes, that's, I completely agree on that. Um, another issue, Tanya, I, obviously the, the, this whole topic is systemic and you mentioned this earlier with education that we don't have financial education in schools. And then of course we have one of the reasons uh, we create these imbalances and in inequities that we see in the world. What else should we change in education in order to create a new generation of girls and boys that see the world as what it is that takes both for life to form, it takes both, it takes female and male for balance in life. Yeah, I I think that, um, and it's in, it's a super interesting question because I have a boy and a girl, oh. and 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 so I can see the differences, and I can also see some of the gender stereotypes that are already in their heads from a very very young age, and that might be because I'm in Asia, and I think that those gender stereotypes are a little bit more prevalent still here than they would be if I was back home in Europe. A little bit, I, I imagine they still exist too, but I can't confirm or deny that because I've only raised children in Asia, but I can see that we're a little bit um, more blue is for boys and girl is for, uh, pink is for girls here. So I, I've realized that girls don't have a confidence issue per se. Girls, I mean, we're certainly and a lot of my friends girls there's no there's no lacking in confidence there's no needing to empower and I think that we all too often think that we have to equip the girls with something more because there's something missing or not there's something not right with with us because that's why we're behind in all these areas that we talk of when you look at education formal education girls excel girls consistently excel and, and I think do better than boys in formal education. And I think that, that so it's not an in, intellectual problem that we have. It's not a problem with confidence either, although I think for girls, confidence does take a hit uh, in our early teens for sure. So I think as a parent, trying to navigate that is really, really important for girls to main, try and retain as much of that as possible. The problem, I think, or, or the thing that I'm focusing on as a parent is to ensure my son, sister, as his equal. Mm -hmm. And if we raise a generation of boys that do not see the difference between themselves and the girls in their class or their sisters at home, I think that is going to have a huge impact on um, gender equality, you know, globally. And, and then I think if you coupled that with, I wish the governments, and this is something that Sophia, I think, should, should take on in, in the not too distant future, is working with governments for, you know, education, for financial education, for, you know, for both sexes. I, I don't think this is, financial education is not, um, is, is gender neutral. You know, it, it should be a um, one size fits all curriculum. And I think if you, if we had, gen, if we had financial education and we had, a generation of boys seeing the girls as equal, I think we would be in a great place. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. And you're addressing also the teens. And it's also in teens that girls are hit more by uh, the industry that sells, this is wrong, you are tough at, you are the UC or that, you know, buy this product, buy that, and you will be fine, and you will be respected, and you will be loved, and you will be popular, and all that. And and this will be the next episode, uh, the, the last episode in this, in this format that will talk about also the concept of self-love, that we teach both genders the concept of self-love because that also fuels during the teen time and teen times and later the self-confidence. I'm okay as I am. Yeah. And diversity, exactly what it is, what's the beauty of us, that we all different, that we all look differently, that we all, as you said earlier, all have different backgrounds, that we all can learn from each other. That's the only way. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Tanya, thank you so much. This is very, very interesting. And uh, listeners, I'm sure that you would like to know more about Tanya, hopefully support also some of Tanya's projects. Um, where can our listeners find you, Tanya? And of course, Sofia. 
Yes, so sophiawomen.com um, is the financial education platform specifically for women. So we've built this platform by women for women. Um, so please come and check us out. We have great membership. Uh, I think that community for women is so important and that's what we're endeavoring to create and foster. Uh, also on LinkedIn, uh, Tanya Rolf. And um, yeah, you can also find us on Instagram, the Sophia Women. Well, we will look there and we'll uh, connect with you there so that we can follow your work um, even more. Thank you so much, Tanya, for your insights. It has been very, very, very interesting. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it and really enjoyed the chat. Thank you. Dear listeners, this concludes today's conversation with Mother Earth that hopefully has shed some light on the lack of gender diversity, such as the venture capital scene. You know that in nature, where there is light, there is life. And we both know, we all know that for life, we need female and males. Hence, let's help Tanya's project shed light on some of these inspiring female founders. Next week, you will hear the last episode of Conversations with Mother Earth in this format. My guest will be another amazing woman, and we will talk about the subject that unites us, namely love.